Okay, part one, we're going to start talk about um, analysis, genetic analysis um, in two different strains that have a single character that is different. Um, so before we get started, I want to kind of cover some of these key terms um, that are important. Um, so again, we use this jargon all the time, and it's important you understand what is meant by this jargon. Um, so these tend to have very specific definitions. So a character is a single visible feature of an organism. Um, so an organism has very... Uh, has many characters. Um, some examples for pea, peas, uh, pea plants are seed color, for example, seed shape, um, but we're not really saying what the, the feature actually looks like. So we're not specifying a seed color, we're just saying seed color is something that can have some sort of variation and it's something that's visible. A trait, in contrast, is one possible variant of a given character. Um, yellow seeds would be an example of that. Um, and there's no limit to the number of traits for a given character. So there could be brown seeds, green seeds, blue seeds. Um, in this chapter, we are limiting ourselves to condition where there are only two traits um, per character, um, but you know, this is not a, a rigid rule, and it's something that will be relaxed in chapter four. The phenotype is the composite of an organism's observable characters, traits that are under study. Um, so the phenotype is not limited to a single character. You know, we could be looking at multiple things at the same time. Um, yellow seeds and white flowers would be an example of a phenotype. Um, and, so, and so when we talk about the phenotype, we're talking about kind of how it looks in total. And so these are some of the uh, characters, some explicit example of characters that uh, Mendel looked at. Um, so he looked at a total of seven different characters. So the characters would be seed shape, seed color, um, pod shape, pod color, flower color, flower position, um, and stem height. Um, and then each one of these had two, two traits. Um, so there's two traits. Um, for each of these characters, um, for the shape that was round or wrinkled, and then on the right you can see visual examples of the difference between these. Color varied between yellow and green, um, so there are yellow pea seeds and then there are green pea seeds. And of course you can have both at the same time, so um, there's not a picture of a yellow wrinkled seed, um, but that is also another possible phenotype that a plant can have. Seeds for peas are contained within pods, so each pod contains multiple seeds, um, and these shapes can have can, can vary. Um, so the pod shape can be either full or constricted, and just visually you can see, you know, you see the individual seeds within the pod. The color of the pod can also vary between green and yellow, and it's important to note that uh, the genetic basis of this color variation is independent of the seed. So you can have green pods with yellow seeds, you can have yellow pods with green seeds, um, or they can be the same. Um, they're independent, um, they're controlled independently, and you can have all four possible combinations. Um, seeds come from flowers, uh, so, so you need to have some sort of fertilization, and so there's also variation in the flowers, both in the colors between violet and white and also the position on the plant. So axial versus terminal. Terminal indicates that they're at the top of the plant. Axial um, is just a different position of the flowers. And then finally, the height, um, tall or dwarf. So you can have very tall pea plants or you can have very um, short pea plants. So these are all of the characters and traits that Mendel was looking at and he was interested in studying how they were inherited. And so he did this through a process called controlled breeding. Um, and so Mendel created artificial populations for genetic analysis. So you know, what this means is the experimenter determines how individuals move. Um, and so what you do is you create essentially a pedigree um, of, of animals with defined parents. And so the first generation is called the P or P0, and that indicates the parental generation. And so one thing to keep in mind about the parents is whether or not they breed true. So very often in a problem or very often in a text, if you're reading something, you might see the parent was breeding true. And so what exactly is meant? Um, it means that if you breed the parent to itself, so pea plants are kind of unusual and that they're able to self-fertilize, um, 
and uh, once they self-fertilize, in other words, um, two independent gametes from a single pea plant are able to be used to create a new offspring. Um, so there's still two haploid gametes that come together. Normally these come from different parents, but in self-fertilization, basically both of the gametes come from the same parent. And so if they breed true, then the, then the trait is stable through time. And so if you breed a tall plant with itself and you only get more tall plants, that means it's breeding true. You can also have certain plants that are tall, but they're able to produce both tall and short offspring. And so in that case, they don't breed true. And um, the genetic definition of this, it just simply means that they are homozygous. So whatever allele they have, both copies are the same. Um, and then the parents typically differ by zero or more, more traits. Um, so you can be looking at multiple characters and the parents can either be the same or they can look different, they have you know, some sort of different phenotype. So the first generation of progeny that are produced from those parents, um, so again, the parents can either be independent plants or they can be um, the same plant, is called F1s. Um, if the F1s are then used as parents to create a further generation, the next generation is called F2s, and then additional generations of progeny can continue to be created. Um, so you can have, you know, 10 generations, 20 generations, you know, you can have very large pedigrees depending on what exactly you're trying to do. Um, in this class, pretty much, we're gonna, only going to concern ourselves with the P0, the F1, um, and the F2 generation, although occasionally you might actually look at the F3s as well. So the most simple situation is a monohybrid cross, and that reveals how one trait is transmitted. So monohybrid hybrid crosses start with two true breeding parents, um, so these two homozygous parents, um, and then the plants or the parents have different traits for one character. The F1 generation is cross progeny between those two parents, and then you um, use the F1 generation to self-fertilize, um, and then that F1 generation produces a large number of F2 offspring. Um, so in this chapter, it's done through selfing. Um, in, other, um, in other problem sets, you might see things like genetic analysis and Drosophila fruit flies. And so in that case, the F1 generation would be crossed by sibling mating. So there would actually be siblings that are mated together um, in order to produce the F2 generation. So Mendel did this for all of these different characters. So he had seven total characters, um, and they each had two different traits. And so each of these um, crosses that he did started with pure true breeding population, the true breeding plants of, of one of the two traits. And so when he crossed those together, one of the interesting things that he found was that it's not actually a blended result. So previously, people thought that there would be some sort of blending between phenotypes. Um, so in the case of the seed shape, that would indicate that you would have some sort of mixture of round and wrinkled. In the case of seed color, the color would be some sort of mixture of green and yellow. Um, but he never saw that for any of the seven traits that he studied. Um, instead, in every situation, the F1 phenotype um, was always the same as one of the two parents. Um, so for seed shape, it was round. For seed color, it was yellow and then so on and so forth. You can just follow the results of this table in the F1 results. And so that indicates that, um, that indicates that there is not a blending inheritance that's going on, but rather a particulate inheritance. And then further in all of these cases, this, this is an example of a dominant trait. So one of these traits um, seems to be dominant over the other. Um, so the round trait is dominant over the wrinkled, and the yellow is dominant over the green. And this actually comes to um, uh, comes to comes down to um, uh, the specific details um, of the two alleles. Um, so this is always a relationship between two alleles, which one is dominant over the other. So then he intercrossed these F ones. Um, you know, so instead of seeing a a set of um, offspring that all shared the same phenotype we now saw a range of different phenotypes um, that observed from this cross, that were observed from this cross. So if you look at the F2, he created a large number of plants. You know, we're talking about thousands of plants for this analysis. Um, and he found 5,474 of them had round seeds and 1,850 of them showed wrinkled seeds. 
Um, so this is an example of an F1 individual. It does not breed true. Um, it was able, if you cross it with itself, it's able to produce multiple phenotypes, even though its phenotype is, is, is simply round. And so then when he calculated the ratio of the different phenotypes, um, he found uh, in common um, for all of these different characters, there is a very common ratio, and that's three to one. So the dominant trait was always most common. It was present three times out of every four individuals. The recessive trait um, was also found, but at a much less frequent rate. So this made him think, okay, what could be causing this very specific ratio that of the and so the explanation for these results is that the character was controlled by a single gene, and that gene had two alleles. So if we looked at the parents, the parents were homozygous for one of those two alleles, um, and then the gametes produced by the parents just contained whatever, whatever that allele that they had. And then one allele was dominant over each other. And so if we follow what is going on in, in this entire cross, um, we can look at this example for, for example, a cross between the tall and the dwarf. Um, so again, these individuals are breeding true, um, and so they're homozygous, um, either big D, big D if they're tall, or little d, little d um, if they're dwarf. Um, so he named, he named the alleles based upon whether or not they're dominant or recessive. So because tall is dominant over dwarf, um, the capital D was used to indicate that. The little d indicates that it's a recessive, uh, recessive trait. And so when you cross these two plants together, you need to know what sort of gametes are formed. So what do the individual plants produce? And so um, for this P0 generation, for both parents, they're only able to produce one type of gamete. So the big D, big D produces a big D gamete. The little d, little d, the dwarf, um, the dwarf individual only produces um, a little d gamete. And so we know with certainty what the genotype will be of the, um, of the F1 generation because we know that they will receive a big D from one parent and they will receive a little d from the other parent. And so the genotype of these F1 will all be heterozygote. So they will be big D, little d. So even though the genotype is all, all the same and they're all heterozygotes, they're, they all will be tall individuals. And that comes from the dominance recessive nature of how this genetic interaction occurs. So now when we do the cross, when we do the intercross between the, um, the F1s, now we need to pay more attention to what sort of gametes can be produced. And because these individuals are heterozygous, they actually have the ability to produce two different types of gametes. So the big D, little d can produce both the big D gamete and the little d gamete. And one of the postulates of, that Mendel proposed was that this would be done in equal frequency. So each of these would produce 50% of the big D gamete, each would produce 50% of the little D gamete. And so in order to look at what the F2 generation is, now we have to worry about probabilities. Okay? And so if you work out the probabilities, what you find is that um, there are actually three different genotypes that you expect to produce in that F2 generation, depending on what exactly is inherited from the parent. Um, but because of the dominance recessive relationship, um, while you have a three types of genotypes that are produced, only only two types of of, of phenotypes are actually produced. Um, so the ratio of this is one to two to one um, for the genotype. So one out of four animals will be homozygous big D, half will be heterozygous, and one fourth will be homozygous for the little d. Um, but because the big D, D, and the big D, little d, the heterozygous and the homozygous um, dominant share the same phenotype, if we look at the phenotype, it's actually three tall to one dwarf. So I've used these terms throughout the um, kind of previous discussion, um, but uh, just to kind of give a, a more formal definition here. So a gene is a unit of inheritance. It's also a sequence of DNA that codes for a molecule that has a function. So uh, nowadays we know that, nowadays we can isolate genes. Um, we actually know their sequence, we know what they encode. You know, one of the early, early examples of a gene was a hemoglobin. So this is what's responsible for transporting oxygen through your bloodstream. Um, and it has some sort of function. 
Um, genes can have differences, so an allele is one possible variant of a given gene. Um, Mendel only concerned himself with two alleles, but there's no theoretical limit to the number of alleles for a given gene. Um, and typically what we, what we mean by this is that there's some sort of difference in sequence um, between the two alleles. So um, a nucleotide might be changed, um, it could be a small deletion, it could be a small insertion, um, but there's some sort of change in the DNA sequence that leads to a change um, in the protein function. And that's kind of why this allele is able to um, influence the phenotype in different ways. The genotype is similar to the phenotype. It's the composite of an organism's allele that influence the phenotype that we're interested in. Um, so big A, little a is the genotype, and you know, we're specifying um, what allele, um, both alleles that an organism carries for the A, um, a, a gene. Um, but as we move into the dihybrid and trihybrid classes, um, you know, the genotype can also specify all the genes under consideration. Um, so in this case, um, this organism is heterozygote for the A gene, but then it's homozygote for the B gene. Um, so the genotype is, again, the composite of all the genes that we're interested in. A gamete, a gamete is a haploid cell that fuses with another gamete to create a new individual. Um, each haploid cell has its own genotype, but because it's haploid, you, know, you only have one copy of each gene. Um, so big A is an example of a, of a haploid genotype. A, B, if you're interested in two different genes, um, and so on and so forth. And then finally, genetic analysis is the process of determining the genotype phenotype map by analyzing phenotypes in multiple generations of progeny. Um, so this kind of previous approach is how um, Mendel um, figured out some of the basics um, of, of inheritance. Um, but you also might be in a situation where you don't know what the genotype is of an individual. You know, so Mendel was able to make sure that his plants bred, tr bred true because he was able to self-fertilize them kind of over and over again until he knew that they were homozygous. Uh, but let's say you uh, wanted to know um, if, a, if a plant um, had a certain genotype. Let's say someone from a different uh, monastery um, gave you a tall pea plant, um, but they had no idea whether or not um, this plant was tall, it was homozygous or, or, um, or heterozygous. Um, so there's two possibilities this plant can be, big D, big D, or big D, little d. And so how do you figure out what the genotype of that plant is? And so a test cross is a one simple way to do it. And the idea is that you cross the individual um, to a homozygous recessive individual. Um, and you look at what the offspring are. So the analysis of the F1 phenotypes tells you what the, what the, the genotype of the plant in question is. So if it's a homozygous tall plant, it would have, this is the, this is the situation in part A, um, that would be, uh, there's only one possible gamete that that in individual can produce, which is big D. Um, and so when you combine that with the, um, little D allele, the little D gamete produced by the homozygous dwarf parent, um, you know for certainty that every single individual would be heterozygote, and consequently every single individual would be tall. In contrast, um, if you look at a, um, if you have a heterozygous individual, that individual can produce two possible gametes. It can produce both the big D and the little d with equal frequency. And in all cases, because it's being crossed to the little d, little d, you're pairing it with a little d allele. Um, and so the result is you would have 50% of the offspring would be heterozygote whereas 50% of the offspring would be dwarf. And so if you see a situation now where you have 50-50, you know the individual is heterozygote. So in the first case, you can you, you see 100% tall individuals, you conclude that the individual in, in question is, is homozygous. In the second case, where it's half and half, you conclude that the individual um, is, is actually a heterozygote genotype. All right, so I think this is the end of the first section, and then we will move into taking this approach and analyzing natural population and pedigrees.